Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Bernard. I'm the president and CEO of Women's College Hospital Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for our Black Healthcare Summit. We have a wonderful lineup uh, for you today, and I'm going to start with a few uh, words of gratitude. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us. I'll introduce them in just a moment. Uh, but I'm going to start with our sponsors, CIBC and Dynacare, who supported this important conversation. I'd also like to thank President and CEO Heather McPherson. She's the President and CEO of Women's College Hospital and Dr. Natisha Masakwai of Nyanda Consulting, who fully supported me in my efforts to pull together this wonderful conversation and are leading our work here at Women's College Hospital as we confront systemic anti-Black racism. So let me start with our incredible panel. I called in every favor I had to get these amazing people all in the same place at the same time to discuss something that is long overdue and critical to us, not only as a nation, but also as a species. Let me start with how I see them on the screen. Everybody except one of our members are here in Toronto, but this broadcast goes out across the world and we hope it does good everywhere. I'm going to start with Lydia Joy Marshall. And if you could wave when I say your name so that the audience uh, knows who you are. Dr. Marissa Joseph. Dr. Aisha Lofters. Dr. Meb Rashid. Dr. Hussam Adel Kudir. Elaine Goldborn. And the first person I actually called, Anye Nurum. Welcome you all to the panel. So I'm gonna say that we have about 90 minutes together. We have a lot to cover. We won't be able to cover everything about healthcare, but we have a packed program for you. Um, we're gonna talk about the issues that are confronting the black community here and quite honestly, globally. We're gonna give you an opportunity to ask questions and we're hopefully gonna provide some solutions to some of the systemic issues that are plaguing the black community in healthcare. So let's get started. So we are at the end of the summer and really the beginning of the fall. And the summer started with a tragic incident that really ignited the consciousness of the world, the murder of George Floyd. But the issues that we're gonna discuss here today started long before Mr. Floyd's horrible murder and are witnessed by what just happened last week in Quebec with the death of an indigenous woman in a hospital while healthcare providers were standing by and taunting her with racial slurs. There's much to be done here and much to be learned. And we hope in this next 90 minutes, you will be on that journey with us. So as we sit here in the second wave of COVID-19, we once again see the pandemic taking its toll across the country, but most profoundly within the black community. And for those of you who are wondering if we're gonna talk about whether or not um, we need to discuss racism in healthcare, we are actually not here to discuss that. What I will say is that there is overwhelming evidence that there is racism in healthcare. And although we may not see it here in Canada, others do. And I'm gonna quote you something from the, uh, a special report from the United Nations Human Rights Council Working Group on African Des Descendants. It's gonna come up on screen and I'm gonna read it aloud. And it says, Canadian history informs anti-Black racism and racial stereotypes that are so deeply entrenched their practice in their practices that its institutional and systemic forms are either functionally normalized or rendered invisible, especially to the dominant, cult, uh, dominant population. What that means for me is that we are not colorblind, but we are blind to racism. Let's start off by giving you a few uh, of the things that we're gonna talk about today and where we're gonna go with this conversation. First, we're gonna talk about what is the climate for patients and healthcare providers in our healthcare system. Next, we're gonna talk about the impact of systemic anti-Black racism on women in particular. And finally, we're gonna talk about how can we set ourselves, up, set ourselves up for success? How can we change our trajectory? And how can we together with the Black community find solutions? So let's get started. So each of our wonderful panelists are experts in their own right. 
and uh, we're going to give each of them an opportunity to talk a little bit about their area of expertise to give full context to our conversation. We're going to start with a few stats uh, just to set, set everything up in terms of the Black community in Canada. You know, when I was researching uh, the literature for this uh, presentation, I found things that surprised me. Uh, for example, 50% of the Black population lives in Ontario, and the vast majority of them live in the GTA. So what we do here in Ontario really has a ripple effect right across the country. And uh, there are actually more Black women in Canada th than men. And uh, we uh, are, are consistently have the poorest health outcomes outside of Indigenous people. What this information doesn't reflect is how complex the Black community is. And one of the things that I came across is that in a lot of literature, there's an assumption that the Black community is completely homogeneous, and we are not. We have come here many different ways. We have experienced many different traumas. We come from many different socioeconomic backgrounds, and that is often not taken into account when people create solutions for the Black community. So we are actually uh, in Canada a lot more like the English Black community, which makes up about 3% of their population and has a similar um, immigration pattern. Uh, we often compare ourselves to the United States, which has about 12% of the population being Black. Or another country which has a huge Black population is Brazil with almost 97 million or 50% of that population. So comparing ourselves to the United States or other countries really does not us no good. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Lydia Dory Marshall and Dr. Uh, Norum who uh, have joined me because it's so important that we start with the community. What I learned in doing this research is that this solution has to be done in concert with the community, it cannot be done separately from the community, and listening to the community is the first step. So uh, Lydia Joy, I'm going to start with you. You are the Vice President of the Black Health Alliance, an organization embedded in the community and committed to addressing the, all of the social determinants of health. What are the important factors that shape the health of the population that we don't see inside of a hospital? And so from your, ex your experience and, pers and perspective, what are the determinants of health um, that affect the Black community? And how is anti-Black uh, racism really playing a role in the Black community? Thank you, Jennifer, for letting me start the conversation. Um, you know, I think for a very long time, um, Black Health Alliance and other community groups have advocated to have racism specifically named and anti-Black racism um, named as a social determinant of health. Uh, we always like to speak about all of the other issues, whether it's housing insecurity, food insecurity, but the reality is this is a, an overarching, almost chronic illness in itself. Um, we do know that race is a social construct, but being such, you know, there are variations with biologically and how we see different um, disproportionately impacts different chronic illnesses. However, this is something that we see consistently of how we're treated, how we're perceived, how we move through healthcare. And so in that way, it consistently needs to be acknowledged so that we can change the trajectory of what happens. Um, I think especially when we're speaking about Black women, um, this perception and how racism overlies how we're seen impacts our health, both when it's over, you know, the examples that you said of when we see insidious acts on, on Black bodies, but it's also in the way some of the positive stereotypes can also impact our health. You know, for example, we speak about Black girl magic, and there's this caricature of how strong we are, but sometimes that can impact that when we present, we present differently, we're not believed in our stories, we have to advocate harder to get treatment, and these are ways that are embedded in the system that also impact our health in that community has been saying over and over again that this needs to be acknowledged and that narrative has to be changed. Yeah, when we spoke in advance, we talked a lot about, you know, some of the stereotypes that people have around uh, Black people in our experience. And, you know, Women's College Hospital is a hospital that was founded to support equity. We are the first women's hospital in Canada with a lens on bringing equity, equity to women. But we even have to admit that primarily meant white women. And the prism of equity has to continuously expand and look for those who are left out. And that's why we are trying to do this very, very important work. And, you know, one of the stereotypes I know that people have around the Black community, as I said, is that we're all the same. And you spoke to the fact of, you know, not really trusting the outside community because of how they perceive us and how they use the information that they collect 
from us, um, mm-hmm. about us. Can you speak to a little bit to that? Definitely. So, you know, I think um, we, we always speak about other countries, you spoke, you know, UK and US, but we have a history here too that, you know, Black bodies have been seen as the test. You know, we even see this right now of there's a weariness when we're looking at um, trying new vaccines, trying new treatments, because there have been cases where we were not for our own good, but it was to be tested for the for the greater good. And these are stories and narratives that are embedded in our communities, our diverse communities. And so we need to rebuild the trust to say, well, was this system actually created for us? Were there Are there areas in the system that can be adapted that it includes our narratives, our beliefs, it includes the way in which we treat ourselves both mentally and physically. And so this is something that has to be rebuilt because right now there's a feeling that we don't see images that reflect us. We don't see staff that reflect us. We don't trust that when data is collected about us, it will be used for us. So, you know, one way in which we can change that narrative is for us to be incorporated in all of those steps. You know, nothing is done about us without us being involved in that. And I know that's something that you, you know, always reiterate, but it's, it's really the crux in all of this, whether it's from research to treatment or everything, that it's an integrative process that we're included in all of it so that we don't trusting an outside group. We are part of the process exactly. and that's the way you rebuild. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and I would say that is echoed in the Indigenous community. We work very closely with the Indigenous community and what we heard loud and clear is nothing without us, uh, nothing for us without us. And we've in- incorporated that into our practices here and we have to extend that now to the Black community. Okay, Dr. N- Dr. Norum, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you have a huge role um, and hence we're, well, those the per- first person I actually called from the outside. Um, you are, and I'm going to I'm going to try to in a short time uh, sum up all the roles that you hold. You are the lead for the Faculty of Medicine's MD program, and the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion lead for the Department of Family and uh, Community Medicine, and chair of the Black Physicians Association of Canada. Uh, you've played an integral Ontario. role of on- oh sorry Ontario sorry I've let you take over the whole country. Uh, well, that'll be next. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you for that correction. So, you know, as a person that really was integral in ho- hopefully shaping the diversity and inclusion conversation at the University of Toronto, um, a university that has a huge effect here in Ontario as um, it is the academic centre for all the teaching hospitals and playing a role in the strategic plan, I want to talk about the experience of Black physicians um, and how you feel that the diversity and inclusion conversation is going on at the university and also what evidence do you see that things are changing and what is yet to be done? Okay, so those are um, heavy questions, but I'll try to go through one at a time. So um, from my hat as the Black Health Dean Lead at, uh, at the University of Toronto and the Faculty of Medicine, I can say that we are seeing change. So I come, you know, bearing good news in that sense. Um, at the University of Toronto, we have a beautiful legacy there of um, Black leadership and allyship, um, where we have had programs that, you know, had been started by um, uh, people like Dr. Miriam Rossi and many others um, to have equity programs for Black um, and Indigenous youth. Um, And then if you fast forward through time now, um, one of our our really great um, leaders in that regard, um, who's in that position now, is um, Mr. Ike Okafor. And so the programs there, um, which include the summer mentorship program for high school students, uh, the community of support, which is for university students across Ontario and at times actually across Canada, who are from underrepresented groups, um, having more access to the information that lots of students who got into medicine um, already had, because many people who are in the field of medicine usually um, have had family members who were in medicine, so already had an advantage. And so the community of support levels the place, giving access to that dinner table conversation that many people um, already had. Um, And then, of course, our Black Student Application Program, which is um, much more of a a culturally uh, appropriate way of having the the applications are reviewed by, um, you know, Black faculty and Black um, community members. There's Black representation at the interviews, but all of the criteria are the same. And so Mm -hmm. what we've seen over time now is that we've gone from, you know, one Black medical student in the incoming class uh, just a few years ago, Mm -hmm. Chica, yes, Um, then we had six then 14, then 16, and then this year we've seen 26. 
And speaking on behalf of my other hat is the Black Physicians Association of Ontario, we've actually seen across the province an increase in the number of Black medical students. And this year we celebrated along with the Black Physicians of Canada and the Black Medical Student Association of Canada, um, the fact that we had over uh, 45 Black medical students across the country starting medical school. So we are seeing change and it's because structures are changing, right? Where we change the policies, we look at why are certain people not represented here and trying to address the barriers, the unfair, unjust barriers that have been in the way. Well, that's wonderful. I was able to sit in on the celebration of welcoming the 45 students uh, into medical school from across Canada. And it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. I literally had goosebumps the entire time. Um, I want to turn a little bit now, uh, Lydia and uh, Dr. Norum, uh, to COVID-19, because I don't think we can leave it out of the conversation. Uh, just driving in this morning, I heard yet another report that there are communities right here in Toronto where, you know, the rate of infection is well over 10% and 3.5% is considered high. I want to talk a little bit, you know, from each of your perspectives. Um, the, the black experience with COVID-19 in, in Toronto, what is it telling you and what it, what it should be telling us about our healthcare system? Lydia, uh, again, I will start with you. Sure. Um, you know, it's been very fascinating for me during this year when we talk about we're in this crisis and we speak about COVID-19 because it feels like in the work that we've been doing, black community has been in crisis for so many other reasons before this. This is just something that has highlighted and exasperated existing so while everybody else is like, well, what are we going to do? You know, this is something that's impacting the way we walk, the, impact, the way we're treated, the way we're viewed. This is something that has already been happening. So, you know, this is another example where the data is important. It's one of the first times that we're able to advocate to say, well, let's see who is disproportionately being impacted. And we were able to have this to emphasize what we have been advocating for of where disparities lie. There's multiple reasons as to why. But again, it goes back to what we spoke about before about social determinants of health and one of those are not this is not something to say oh well there must be something biologically distinct why we're seeing a greater number in the black community it's because of all the other disparities that we have been advocating to close the gap on before is now highlighted in this global pandemic so you know what we're hoping is that this shines a light on what we've been seeing build and we come out of this, we'll be able to address all of these things. We'll be able to acknowledge what systemic things were in place before this, what biases were there before that allowed for the gap to continue. To and how can we address this in partnership with community going forward after the pandemic is over? Yeah, because the stats are pretty uh, shocking. You know, uh, many people have heard that Black uh, people make up about 9% of the population here in the GTA, um, but account for over 22% of the cases of COVID-19. And I know that uh, one of the markers of inequity is disproportionality. And that kind of disproportionality demonstrates a huge inequity. Uh, Dr. Norum, uh, would you like to add to that? Yes, definitely. I, so there's two pieces I'd like to add. One is I'm going to circle back to one piece you'd asked me before about the Black physician experience. And mm -hmm. with that, I'm going to tie that into the COVID-19. Because when we're thinking about um, the impacts of anti-Black racism, it really has impacts in all spaces. So whether that's in the classroom, the streets, the courtroom, the hospital, or the boardroom, our, um, the barriers that we face, just like Lydia said, those impact the social determinants of health. That impacts how many of us are in leadership positions to bring our lens to decision making. It impacts how many of us enter medicine. Like, you know, yes, we celebrated something very wonderful recently, but our previous history has been, you know, the perhaps unintentional exclusion of Blacks from the field of medicine. And really, it's because the way, as you mentioned with the United Nations, the way that anti-Black racism works and many forms of racism is it's rendered invisible. We know in our history that we had, we have a legacy in Canada and in North America of slavery. People like to talk about the implicit biases, but where do they come from? They come from the stereotypes that were created during slavery, like being less intelligent, having a different pain threshold, um, not to be trusted. And so these play out in all of those different um, spaces so that we have done research and our black physicians have experienced racism in medicine, but people working in many fields are experiencing that racism as well. So what happens then is that you have people that in their day-to-day -day life have the extra stress 
of experiencing these stereotypes, experiencing these barriers to opportunities. And so that stress plays a role um, on their health. It takes a toll, putting them at you know a greater risk for chronic diseases like hypertension. So more likely to be sick. Then on top of that, less likely, as I mentioned, to be in decision-making positions to bring our, our um, lens. And then when those people are sick, then present into healthcare to be at risk of being treated with less dignity because of the color of their skin. So all of that intertwines, and we've seen that as this perfect storm in COVID-19, where we are overrepresented as service providers. We are overrepresented as PSWs. We are overrepresented as a number of different fields that cannot stay home and self-isolate. We're overrepresented in housing situations where we are overcrowded. And that is really very much due to the systemic racism. And the way it works is it becomes normalized. It's normal not to see us in leadership positions. It's normal not to see us as doctors. And so we need to change our thinking. We need, as our Indigenous colleagues say, we need to decolonize our minds. We need to think differently. And we need to understand that anti-Black racism plays a role in healthcare and really think right now about changing the culture of healthcare. Because ultimately, as was said before, and both of you said it, but thinking about who's at the table and who this healthcare system was built for, it was originally, these systems were built with through the imagination and coming together of white, male, cisgendered, you know, um, heterosexual Christian males and to serve um, that population. But now Canada is different. This is a time for us to come together and reimagine and rebuild what it means to have that quality care and be treated with dignity. So we are in a historic moment. Um, there's a lot, this is a challenge, but it is a historic moment for important change. I love that passion. And I, I think we feel it here at Women's College Hospital and that's why we're so proud to lead this work and take a leadership position in doing so. Um, you know, we believe that we have a, a, a social uh, safety net and we also believe we have a healthcare safety net because we have universal healthcare. But what COVID, showed the world was that the net has many, many holes and many people are falling through it. And if we don't do something about it, you know, I often talk to people who are more worried about the economy than who uh, is sick and dying. And I, you know, it, it, it amazes me. And, you know, sometimes I have to put it in very stark terms. You know, people, um, all people deserve the right to be treated equal. But, you know, COVID-19 shone the light out. If we don't take care of everybody, nobody gets better. If we don't take care of the Black community, no one will get better because the Black community, in many ways, is the backbone of the, the, the system. Um, you know, women are the backbone of the system. 85% of the nurses in Canada are women, many of them Black. The PSWs, the frontline workers, we must. We have a moral obligation to do it. It is the right thing to do. It is a social justice issue, and it is better for all of us. So I say that I, I am in total uh, in concert with you, with your, your, your passionate, your speech. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in detail about women, because obviously we're a women's hospital. We have expertise around women. We're founded over 135 years ago. And as I said off the top, we, you know, when we talked about women for a long time, we were primarily talking about, you know, white, cisgendered, uh, you know, women who uh, really came from the downtown core. And now we're a hospital that looks outward. We are uh, an ambulatory and a virtual hospital. We are trying to fill the gaps that uh, regular hospitals or traditional hospitals do not. We're trying to change from a 1950s style healthcare system to a modern world that looks at all the diversity. But black women, um, I have to say, when I was doing this research, I was actually quite shocked myself as a black woman, how far behind we are. So we're gonna just hone in on that just a little bit. Um, I'm just going to uh, quote a few stats. Uh, you know, people talk about as many Black women living in poverty, um, obviously struggling with violence, decent employment, housing, and proper services. But let's talk about the healthcare issues, overrepresented in almost every chronic disease. And what stood out to me in all of the stats that I that I researched was that. You know, chronic disease is something you, you associate with older people, you know, people 50 and up, 60 and up, uh, seniors. And the average age of a black woman with chronic disease is 31. 
really in the prime of her life. And we're talking diabetes, we're talking cardiovascular disease, we're talking cancer, we're talking HIV, we're talking lupus, we're talking hypertension. These diseases and mental health are their onset in the black community and for black women is so much younger taking away the best years of their life. And the black community is actually quite young in Canada. The vast majority of us are under 65. So we should in fact be a healthier community, but we are not. So I'm going to turn over to Dr. Abdel uh, Kudir um, and talk a little bit about data. We've heard this cry for data right from the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but I know that uh, the Black community has been asking for it long before that. Uh, so Dr. Um, Abdel Kudir, let's talk a little bit about data. You're really passionate. You're a scientist here at Women's College Hospitals Research Institute. Um, you're a cardiologist at Women's College College Hospital. Um, you uh, hold the Women's Heart and Brain Health Chair from the um, Heart and Stroke and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And you're a director at the Black Physicians of Association of Ontario. So a full plate again. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Why is data so important? Why the call for data? Why desegregated data? Tell us the power of that. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for um for organizing this and also for giving me the opportunity to speak on this really important issue. Um, I guess the branch of science that I practice in is clinical epidemiology, which kind of to put it simplistically, we study what has happened to people in the past to try and predict what's gonna to happen to them in the future, and then hopefully use that information to try and improve their outcomes. But the reality is that we're really tied to that piece. Like if we do not have data on what has happened to someone in the past, we cannot predict what's gonna to happen to someone like them in the future. Ergo, if we do not have data on what is happening to black people and other racialized minorities, we just are not gonna be in a position to be able to help them. So, I mean, we're, this is a different branch of science than something like physics or chemistry. Uh, like Einstein in 1920 could predict what's gonna happen like 20 years later, right? With, you know, all stuff. But human and health behavior, believe it or not, is even more complex than quantum physics. It is just absolutely impossible to predict what's going to happen when you consider mixing biology, the environment, human behavior, either by the person who's going to become the patient themselves and the society around them. Especially when you consider something like racism, right, which, you know, is overt, is covert, and can manifest in a lot of different ways. And COVID is the best example of this, right? Like we as a world, we have all the best minds in the world trying to solve the issue of COVID-19. And we have done, you know, we like we just have not been very successful. And the reason for that, despite all the minds and the resources that are going into this is we just have no data on this before. So in the absence of data on what has happened in the past with COVID, we cannot do anything in the future. Um, so without having good data on how black individuals and other racialized minorities interact with the healthcare system, uh, we're just flying blind. Uh, we are not gonna be able to help them and we will not be able to address the health inequities that are related to anti-black racism without being able to collect context specific data. So let's dig into that a little bit. You know, what I've heard about collecting data, it's, it's not easy, it's time consuming, it's expensive. Uh, tell me about some of the barriers to collecting data in the Black community and why uh, that, you know, poses yet another issue option for the Black community. Now, so it's, there are many, I said, many layers to what makes this challenging. Part of it just comes from um, the priorities of, um, you know, the people that hold the political levers of power and the people that hold the purse strings. For, whatever, for many reasons, it's been felt to either not be important or not be necessary. And because of that, you know, we just don't have as much race-based data in Canada. It's created a huge blind spot. Um, for, so whenever I or many people have to do talks on the impact, uh, the interaction between like black race and uh, health, uh, we present data from the United States because that's just the best data that we have. But just like you, just like many people have said already, these data are just not applicable to Canada. There's a very different context to this black diaspora. There's a very different context to our healthcare system. And maybe we may have different societal attitudes towards race. Um, we just don't know. But the problem is that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Um, however, many people have used this data gap to propagate the idea that 
racism is just not a big deal in the Canadian healthcare system, which any person on this panel or any black patient will tell you is just simply not true. And mm -hmm. I think once again, I go back to COVID, but it sort of, you know, just was a clear example of this, right? Like, you know, in the early days of COVID in March, if you remember, um, it seems like such a long time ago, but we did not have data by race and there was a demand to release data by race in Ontario. And, you know, people said, we do not need that data because we care about everyone. And so, um, so basically, you know, so the reason why this conversation all began is because some of the researchers at U of T presented data, not by race, because they did not have that information, but just based on the makeup of neighborhoods by race. So because we did not have data on race, they relied on how many ethnic minorities live in different neighborhoods. And just even that data, which is a very poor surrogate, showed stark differences. And that was sort of what began this whole conversation. Um, and I bet you that if we look under the hood in almost any other disease entity, uh, we will see similar stark differences in uh, outcomes um, that affect uh, black patients and racialized minorities in a negative way. Right. And, you know, I said yesterday, I was in an interview, you know, people think that when you are looking for race based data, you're looking for racism. Uh, and you're not. We assume that there is racism. What we are looking for is the impact of racism and the solutions that are going to support that community. So, uh, you know, this idea that you're you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, identify racism, I, I think, is again a, an old construct that we need to, we need to get rid of. Thank you so much for that that background on data. I'm going to turn now to uh, Elaine Goldborn. She is a, she's a, a colleague here at Women's College Hospital. She's the director of clinical resources. Um, she is the administrative director at the Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancers at Women's College Hospital, and um, works very much uh, with the frontline staff on uh, in the cancer area. And I'm going to focus on this because this is a chronic disease that you know kills um, many many Canadians and many women. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about data and what the lack of data um, around Black women in particular and their health risk for, can uh, for cancer, what that does, does that, um, what does that do in terms of the care of Black women with cancer? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. And um, I would like to start with a story to lend some context. Uh, Natasha is a young black woman diagnosed with breast cancer. She's also a new immigrant to Canada and during her journey with breast cancer, she did not receive any genetic testing. She has limited family history taken and her treatment rendered her the inability to conceive. During her treatment, her aunt was also diagnosed with breast cancer. She later died from her disease because she presented what we know about research is that when it comes to breast cancer, Black women are significantly more likely to present with less favorable um, tumor at the time of diagnosis than their white women counterparts. Researchers in US and the UK have also found a remarkable difference between um, white women and Black women at the age of diagnosis, their tumor stage and size, with worse outcomes for Black women. In Canada, we know that the research is ongoing, but it's limited and we're getting there. And we have some being done at Women's College Hospital by our own research team. Dr. Stephen Nero, one of our renowned scientists here at Women's College Hospital, recently published a study that really highlighted that Black women with a history of a precancerous condition called DCIS have a higher mortality rate than other women. And the question that I really ask myself is why are Black women and women in my culture present late? Why do they shy away from research studies? And there are a few things in terms that came to mind is that maybe they've had a bad experience with the system. They have a lack of knowledge about how to navigate the healthcare system. And this is true of immigrant women to Canada. Or we haven't really heard their voices. 
or we haven't meet them where they're at to hear their stories. I know, and I've often reflect on this, is um, Black women are very religious in nature, are most Black women. And what I've learned um, from speaking to my colleagues is that Black women have a strong faith, and their faith guide their decision. They guide their decision when it comes to health outcomes, guide their decision when it comes to treatments. And I know that in order for us to reach Black women, reach, we have to reach them where they're at, reach them in their community setting, in churches, and really partner with Black organization, leading Black organization. But we have to first listen, then engage, before right. we educate, inform, or support. And we see this in the Indigenous community as well. We have to, you know, live beyond our walls and not be in our ivory towers and go out into the community and work with organizations like the Black Health Alliance and the Black Physicians Associations of Ontario to really start that dialogue. But, you know, there is an, even a more systemic issue um, that, you know, plagues women generally. Um, most people don't know that until the 1990s, women were completely excluded from all research studies. So it wasn't until almost in the 2000s that women as a, a gender were included. And so you can imagine uh, how small a proportion of racialized women and black women in particular are in research studies. And I read a really stark statistic around cancer saying that Oh, of the 2,000 uh, uh, cervical and breast cancer research studies taking place in Canada, only 23 studies focused uh, on cancers in Black women. That was less than, that was just barely 1%. And so when, uh, you know, other communities are participating and having, you know, really great results. I mean, prevention in cancer is so key, and you talk a lot about that. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of literature now that supports um, you know, prevention and the Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancer really focuses on prevention, but black women are not even part of that conversation. And then we are part of the conversation only sort of at almost the end stage. So turning that around is going to be key to our survival. Cancer is, uh, you know, one of the top leading causes of death you know, with cardiovascular disease. And we are we are literally dying because we don't have access to specialists, I've been told. We don't have access sometimes to primary care. We don't know how to navigate the system. We are not included in research studies. So for all of these reasons, the black community is at risk. Thanks, Elaine. All right. I'm gonna turn it over to um, one of our, um, one of our, another one of our wonderful physicians here, Dr. Aisha Lofters, who I, I, I remember running into just after she was appointed. And I really, I was a little starstruck. I actually didn't say anything. I just smiled a lot. So I'm so pleased to be here with her today. She holds the chair in implementation science at the Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancer at Women's College Hospital. She's an associate professor at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto and she's a family physician and although she holds the chair uh, and is very involved in cancer research I really wanted to talk to her about being a chair holder which is not a role that you see a lot of black women in in healthcare in Canada and I want to talk a little bit about you know what it was like ascending to that that very high and lofty uh, position as a research chair as a black woman and what was your experience uh, in navigating uh, becoming a chair uh, thanks, Jennifer, and th thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be having this conversation and with uh, this great group of panelists. Um, so, you know, when I think about my journey, uh, I was thinking first about the barriers, but then I thought I should reframe that and actually think about what it is that led me to success. Um, yeah. Because I have to acknowledge that I have my own privileges, right? And that's part of what led me here. And I think those privileges do highlight barriers the Black community in general do face. So first of all, um, I, as, as Dr. Nora mentioned, I did grow up kind of having those inner table conversations, right? I grew up in the household of a physician, but we know that Black people are underrepresented in medicine. I was fortunate enough though to have, um, to have a doctor in my household and to come, come into the whole process with the knowledge, right? With, with that perspective. That also meant that I didn't have to work um, multiple jobs and I could focus on my schooling because again, I had, that, I had that privilege. But when we think about people in the black community, that's, they're disproportionately likely to be able to have those opportunities. Um, I also was very fortunate to have great mentors in the world of research. As with any other field, 
mentorship and networking is huge. I was fortunate enough to have mentors that uh, were sponsors really that were able to make connections for me um, you know, provide me with opportunities. But we know that when it comes to mentorship, Typically, people who are in positions of power are going to mentor those who remind them of themselves. So if traditionally you have white men in positions of power, the people who are going to remind them of themselves that are around them are going to be other white men, maybe who went to the same school or who grew up in the same environment. So what this means is that if you're a woman, you're less likely to receive that mentorship. If you're a person of color, you're less likely than if you're a woman of color, then you've got that intersection, that double whammy of, of less likely to be, have that mentorship. As I said, though, I was lucky, and I do reflect on that again, that part of what got me here is that I did have mentors who were able to, to see past that and were able to, to sponsor me and to help push me forward in the field. So I want to talk a little bit uh, more about having, you know, people from diverse uh, backgrounds and diverse perspective and cognitive diversity in research. You know, you know, research is, um, you know, I think I heard you say you were you were interviewed and you usually research the things you care about. Um, you're driven to do that. And, you know, if you don't have anybody from certain communities doing research, those communities are left out. I'd like you to talk about why it's so important not just to have women at the table, but diverse people at the table when we're talking about research. Yeah, so I mean, this was touched upon before, but if everyone in positions of power and positions of decision making, that, that includes the world of research, if everybody in those positions has the same lived experience, this means they're going to have the same blind spots. They're going to be missing the same thing and not knowing that they're missing it. Diversity improves the quality of research because it brings perspectives that previously weren't even known to be missing. So, I mean, we can all think about an experience when you were trying to work through something, trying to figure something out, and someone else just walks in and they just see it, right? Because they have a different perspective and they have a different viewpoint. And that happens on a macro level when we talk about uh, diversity in research. So when we think about improving healthcare in Canada, again, to your point earlier, Jennifer, it, there's first, there's a moral imperative, right? To, to improve diversity simply because of who we are as a nation, but it benefits all of us if you increase the diversity around the table and you um, increase the brain power around the table to produce better quality research and better quality health outcomes. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna take another shift um, and we're gonna bring in a, a few more of our panel members. So um, in 1943, uh, Women's College Hospital made history by appointing Canada's very first woman leader of an academic division of dermatology. And today we have one of the largest dermatology departments in, the Canada, in Canada, over 50% of the dermatologists in Canada work here at Women's College Hospital. In fact, three of the uh, only six black dermatologists in Canada also work here. And I'm delighted to have one of them with us today, uh, Dr. Marissa Joseph. So Dr. Joseph is a board certified pediatrician and dermatologist. She is a full, ac full academic faculty at the University of Toronto and the medical director of the Ricky Schachter Dermatology Center here at Women's College Hospital. Dr. Joseph, I'm really delighted to have you here today because I think dermatology is one of those areas that doesn't literally get enough light. And I was so fascinated when we, we spoke about what the impact um, of skin issues um, on the quality of life of people, and in particular, how yet again, black people and black women were sort of falling behind in, in the care that they received. Can you talk a little bit about um, dermatology generally, and then some of the specific concerns um, that the black community faces? Absolutely, thank you so much for inviting me um, for this important conversation. Um, I think when we look at dermatology, it's a case study that could probably be applied to other facets or, or areas in medicine. And I'd like to put it in four main buckets. I think the first bucket has already been addressed by my colleagues beautifully about the social determinants of health and access. As we look at dermatology specifically, the first is education. Traditionally, when we look at skin disease um, in our textbooks and in our curricula, it really reflects white patients or lighter skin patients. And there's no question that skin disease presents differently in black skin and in also other racialized groups. And if we don't teach how to recognize those skin conditions, then there's a delay to diagnosis, there's worse outcomes. And then when we don't study, the second bucket is research. When we don't study what those outcomes are in those presentations, then there's worse outcomes. As with respect to skin, 
there are skin diseases that are localized to the skin. And then there's also skin diseases that are a window to other autoimmune conditions. So very often, lupus, sarcoidosis, the first sign that a patient manifests is in the skin. And we often see, um, and those conditions are disproportionately represented in the black community. So we'll often see black women presenting with debilitating skin disease. They are so stigmatized. I spoke with one woman on the phone who commented to me that her sarcoidosis hadn't really, the COVID-19 pandemic had not really changed her life because she didn't like to leave the house. She didn't like to be seen by other people. And we know that with skin diseases, especially when there's a lot of complications and um, difficulties in treating it, this can cause people to have profound effects on their mental health, increased rates of suicidality. Um, and that sort of lends us to the last bucket, which is clinical care and therapeutics. We are behind when we look at the treatment of skin disease, especially in black skin. When we look at different interventions that we have for white skin, if you apply that to a black patient, that can cause more harm and more complications such as discoloration, dispigmentation, pain, um, and so there really is a black hole in terms of the treatment modalities that we'd like to offer and having those clinical tools available. That's wonderful. Yeah, when we spoke, you know, you know, I really hadn't thought about needing different tools. Um, you know, you were talking about some of the lasers and, you know, the things that, you know, are available to other communities just damaging our skin. And even the education, which, you know, you have to always take it back a step to say, who is providing this care and, and how are they educated? Um, what do they know? Um, you know, it, that's why it is systemic, because it's, you know, many layers deep. So um, a really special area that I'm so glad we we, we got a moment to talk about. Now I'm going to turn uh, it over to Dr. Meb Rashid, who um, I had a wonderful conversation with at the front door of the hospital early in the pandemic. And Dr. Rashid is the medical director of the Crossroads Clinic here at Women's College Hospital, Ontario's first hospital-based refugee clinic. And he's really a pioneer, like so many here, and so passionate about his work. And, um, you know, running the Crossroads Clinic, I, I, I bumped into him and I said, you know, how are things going? And he said to me, you know, it's rough out there for those uh, in the refugee shelters and the refugee world. And he said, you know, they're doing so much to help us all, to keep us all alive. And we owe it to them to help them. And uh, that's one of the reasons I definitely wanted to have uh, Dr. Rashid here to talk about the Crossroads Clinic and the patient population that it serves, because I think they too are invisible and many of them are, are, are Black. So Dr. Rashid, can you tell us a little bit about the Crossroads Clinic? Because it is so unique. People may not even be aware of the type of services and the type of people that you welcome into that service. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for the invite. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, the uh, have this really important issue addressed. So the Crossroads Clinic is a clinic uh, that was put together um, here at Women's College Hospital. We started seeing our first patient at the end of 2011, and it's a clinic that serves newly arrived refugees and refugee claimants here in Toronto. Uh, we've seen over 5,000 people who've come through, um, you know, and although there's different waves and there's different fluxes depending on what's going on in the world, uh, over 50% of our patients have come from countries in Africa, another 20% from the Middle East, and parts of Asia and a scattering from all around the world. Um, so it's it's a tremendously interesting population. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I, I remind people about, um, you know, there's this uh, uh, stereotype of refugees being poor and uh, sometimes uneducated. And certainly we've seen people with very little education. People have never had the opportunity to go to school. Um, but really being a refugee is about persecution. So we've also seen people who have been ambassadors in their country. We've seen people who have been governors of regions. We've seen physicians and nurses and engineers. Um, and, you know, every refugee's journey is a little bit different. So we've had people, uh, you know, who've had folks uh, knock on the front door. They've come out the back and gotten on a plane. Um, you know, often uh, uh, they've been in Canada within days of suffering quite immense trauma. Uh, and then we've had other people who have left their home countries, um, you know, sometimes uh, five, ten years ago, and have had these torturous journeys, uh, often with, uh, with tremendous trauma, uh, along the way as well. So uh, it's it's a really varied, uh, but tremendously interesting population. 
So tell us a little bit about what you've done, particularly during COVID-19, to reach out to this uh, this patient population who, you know, don't get to self-isolate all the time at home, don't uh, often live in less than ideal living circumstances, um, and some of the, the things you've done outside of our walls here at Women to reach out to them. Yeah, you know, it, like the entire healthcare system, uh, we quickly pivoted to doing most of our assessments virtually. Um, and, you know, at a time, I, I guess, in March and April, where so many of my friends were home baking bread and looking for flour, and, uh, you know, we would call our patients and, uh, you know, uh, they would be on the TTC going to work or they'd be in their workplace working in factories, um, working in, uh, in the healthcare center, sector. Um, so, you know, it's no surprise that when we first started seeing the data coming out that 45% of COVID here in Ontario was in new immigrants and refugees, where really, um, you know, that population makes up 23% of, uh, of Ontarians. Um, and, you know, when we look at refugee women, uh, you know, when we look at women coming from Nigeria, women who are coming from Jamaica, the vast majority of those women who were testing positive were healthcare workers. And of course, those are not, you know, what, what sort of jobs in healthcare we're talking about? We're talking about those low income entry jobs. Uh, we're talking really about a lot of personal support workers who are working in congregate living settings or in long-term care institutions. Um, you know, and a bit of a reminder, many of our patients were still waiting for their, uh, their papers here in Canada, and many of them were still estranged from their families. So, you know, at a time when they were taking care of our families, often they, uh, they were not able to be with their own, which uh, yeah. was tremendously chilling. As far as what we've done, um, you know, we, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we, we've never really closed. We continue to take on new patients. Uh, many people are having a really difficult time finding a primary care in the community. Um, you know, people have been struggling a little bit with the use of technology. Many of our patients have phones. Uh, it becomes a, a lifeline for folks to, to keep track of what's going on in their home country and sometimes to be connected to family. But for those that didn't, we were able to, to get some old phones to distribute. Um, you know, and uh, um, it's, it's been a, a tremendous challenge for people to, to um, really embrace this digital divide as well. So uh, we've been trying to help people navigate, um, you know, how to access virtual care, um, you know, how to, how to find private space to be able to, to have those conversations. Um, you know, I think one of our greatest challenges as we go to, um, to more virtual care is that, uh, you know, such a significant part of our practice is based on developing that that trusting relationship, um, you know, making sure people feel safe uh, in the, the environment in which they're being seen. And that's much more of a challenge when we're restricted to using telephone or, or even virtual calls. So it's been a challenge. There's been some pivoting, but, um, you know, we're hopeful we'll be able to build on experiences moving forward. Yeah, and you touched on a couple of important themes there. You know, we've talked a lot about the importance of research and in every patient population, including refugees, we know that research is important. And I think we were having a conversation not too long ago where we talked about, you know, if you want to learn about refugees, you don't necessarily set up a research study in downtown Toronto, um, you know, in the middle of the day when most refugees live on the periphery of the system uh, of the city, don't have perhaps access to a car, don't don't want to pay $24 to park and certainly don't want to come into to the city often with their children because they don't have, you know, perhaps a, a child care. So in looking at some of the barriers um, for research, um, you know, this population yet again, um, I even heard somebody say, you know, um, they did a research study and they did it only in English, knowing that most of the refugees only knew uh, other languages. So when we look at the barriers, you know, some of them are so entrenched. Um, you know, we are right in the center of the city. We have beautiful facility, um, but if you can't get here, we're not much use to you. And also talking about the virtual care. We've talked a lot about virtual care during uh, the pandemic and uh, Women's College Hospital, you know, had took a bold step two years ago to really move into virtual care. Um, but what we also realize is that we have to evaluate the impact of virtual care and make it available in different ways. And virtual is not the same as digital. Um, it really is a new system of um, organizing the healthcare system so you can actually be where the patient needs you to be and not the, the other way around. In much the same way that banking changed about 30 years ago. So this digital divide is gonna be very important for us to sort of deconstruct as we move forward with research and especially in uh, communities like the black community. All right, we're at about 1024. 
I want to make sure that we give uh, an opportunity to talk about some of the solutions. So I'm going to skip one of the questions I had and bring everybody back into the conversation and give you a few minutes each to talk about um, fixing the system, making it better, making it more equitable, accessible, making that research that we've all heard about um, more available and more abundant. So I'm going to go in the order I see you on the screen again, and I'm going to ask each of you to think about and answer this question in, in, in the way that really applies to your area of expertise. If you could change one thing in the system in your respective area that we could measure, because measurement is important. If you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. Um, over the next five to 10 years, that you, would, that you believe would change the lives of Black patients, what would that be and why? And Lydia, I'm putting you back on the spot because you've been, uh, you've been off at the spotlight for a little while. What would you change and why? Um, I think the very first thing is that it, it's not considered an extra to consult with community. I would make it an integrated part of the clinical pathway that we are mutually learning from one another. So your, your workforce, your clinician, your healthcare should reflect the people that you're serving and it should be led by community when you're speaking about these types of issues. So my wish list would be that we have mutual programs where those in community who are disproportionately impacted, all of the things we've spoken about today, um, they can teach the healthcare providers and vice versa so that that trust is built, so that programs are built and that it's an integrated system at every level. Thank you. Dr. Joseph, what would you do? Um, if I had to choose one, I think diagnostics in dermatology is a huge issue. So I, one thing that I think we need to do, not if I could do it, we need to do it, is over the next five to 10 years, delineate how skin disease presents in other skin types other than white. Um, and that's black skin, that's other racialized individuals. Document that and integrate that into our curriculum. And then the deliverable at the end is to look at people's comfort and expertise at the end of diagnosing skin disease in, in darker skin types. We've started to do that. So we've done needs assessments, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. And we're trying to change the curriculum to integrate that. But I think that will be a huge piece that down the line will lead to better recognition, better, go, better clinical outcomes for our patients, and also a reestablishment of the trust with our patients. A lot of our patients stop going to see dermatologists because they feel that they're not understood, their skin is not understood. So that's what I would do. And I know that we are at the very beginning of a conversation about starting um, a skin of color center of excellence here at Women's College Hospital, something I'm very excited about and where I think we can uh, demonstrate incredible leadership. Um, and that could be a model for the rest of the, the community since we have such a large portion of the dermatologists here at Women's. Uh, Dr. Lofters, what would you do and why? Um, as a researcher, I think that we need explicit funding for research that looks at race and racism in health. And I think that we need explicit funding to support black researchers so that I, as a research chair, would not be an unusual thing to be a black woman as a research chair. Um, and you know, I, I, I make that call for explicit funding. I know, we know that black people in Canada have experienced systemic and structural disadvantage since we've come to Canada. So providing explicit support is not providing any unfair advantages. It's just starting to begin to level the playing field. It also, as I touched upon before, it really increases the diversity of voices uh, that are around the table, contributing to the research that's being produced in this country, and that benefits all of us. It also helps to counter that message that we don't belong in certain spaces. Like, I don't want to be the only researcher in a particular Agreed. space. Agreed. I know everybody on this panel has been the only one in a particular space, and it does send a subtle message, right, that we don't belong or that certain doors are closed for us. So I think if there's explicit funding to support the research, to support the researchers and to help set them up for success. Wonderful. I love that answer. Uh, Dr. Rashid. Um, so, yeah, I, I certainly can um, see the benefits of increased representation. It's, uh, you know, I think in our world, it's so important to acquire trust uh, from the population we're serving so that they can speak about their trauma, they can speak about the issues they're struggling with. And it makes such a tremendous difference when they can see some overlap with the clinicians that uh, 
uh, that are serving them. Um, you know, I was born in Tanzania and I left when I was five years old to come to Canada. Uh, and it's amazing how many times I bring that up with our African patients, maybe overstating it, uh, but just having those types of links make a tremendous difference. Uh, so for people to see clinicians who uh, have had similar journeys to what, uh, what they're enduring um, uh, makes a tremendous difference to people. I know that one of the things you're very passionate about are patient navigators who come from the communities of um, people that come into Crossroads clinics and so that they can see also people who are very successful because I think there are so many uh, stereotypes about refugees and you know what they how they got here what they do when they get here and what they represent in Canadian society and you know that's one of the roles that is novel uh, in the healthcare system because most hospitals don't even have a program that addresses this population so that's the kind of role that we would love to grow so that there are many navigators because um, I think the last time I was on a tour with you you were saying that we have some sort of hotline where any uh, language that's spoken on earth, we can get a person on the phone that speaks that language. So that person can converse in their own language um, while they're having a healthcare experience here at women's. And a step better would be having somebody in the room who also understands them. So I know that's something you're very passionate about. Dr. Abdel Qadir, uh, what, would you, uh, what would you be on your wish list uh, over the next five to 10 years and why? Um, Jennifer, I, I would wish that I guess we could use the lessons that we've learned about improving research for women, which you know has long been and continues to be an underserviced group in healthcare and research, and apply um, the lessons where applicable uh, to improving research in uh, racialized minorities. Um, and if you look at the big picture, it's sort of been a carrot and stick approach. Um, like Aisha said, you know, funding is important. Scientists, like everyone else, will follow the money. But I think also public discussions such as this that drive home the point that this is important and will incentivize scientists to do this research. I think we also have to enable a research environment where this can be done well. Um, so part of it involves sort of building the expertise and know-how um, in terms of how to do this kind of research and, and, re and learn um, you know, the interaction of race with social determinants of health and some of the key policies and make that perhaps eventually part of the learning that someone like myself would be expected to do when they go through clinical epidemiology, uh, but also train people um, to engage racialized minorities who, you know, for reasons that have already been discussed, have, uh, have an inherent distrust of authority and the healthcare system and power structures to find ways such that they are involved in the research as equal partners rather than just research subjects. And then once I think that groundwork has been set such that it can become a fair ask, I think that's sort of when you bring out the stick approach and it becomes mandatory as a scientist that you consider this. So right now the Canadian Institutes of Health Research in any funding ask from them explicitly ask you to address how sex and gender are incorporated into your research. Um, I don't think it's fair for us to mandate that of scientists yet because we haven't you know, created the environment where it is, uh, you know, where they're encouraged to do that and where we have the infrastructure to do it. But once that is built, I would hope that 10 years from now, we're in a position where it is fair to ask scientists to address those issues before they get public funding. That's wonderful. That's something that we really focus on here at Women's College Hospital, everything through a sex and gender lens. Adding that, that cross-section of race in the future will make the research that much more valuable. Uh, Elaine Goldburn, uh, what would you ask for and, uh, and why? I think for me, I would say that I would want to reach more Black women with NS cancer screening by leveraging partnerships with their community organization, with um, Canadian Cancer Society, and looking at creating initiatives and programs that, that we're going out, outreaching to reach women in their community, reach them where they're at, so that we can really um, focus on screening, looking at engagement, looking at education, looking at providing information and support so that we're building more programs that are more than just face-to-face, -face, they're virtual in lens. So as Meb said, that we can reach individuals beyond our walls, nationally, locally, as well as internationally as well, because it shouldn't have any boundaries. 
and making sure really that we're saving lives like Natasha and her aunt, looking at more race-based, um, culturally focused research that will inform practice for us and inform care as we move forward. Thank you, wonderful, let's save some lives. And Dr. Norum, you have the final, you have the final word and the final opportunity. Okay, well, I echo all of the sentiments of um, my colleagues who have spoken so far. I think the thing that I would like to see is an urgent mobilization of resources. I think many leaders are trying to um, act with some urgency to address these issues, but in this context where we're in a pandemic, um, as I mentioned, all of us in healthcare need to reimagine what that looks like. But where we're dealing with um, issues of um, anti-Blackness um, or you know, anti-Indigeneity, uh, I think we really need to bring in the resources, the, the recommendations everybody brought forward. This is major change management. This is for a major shift. And so you need to bring in anti-racism experts or anti-oppression or equity experts and or invest in the resources to protect the time of the black, indigenous, and other staff who want to do this work. Because otherwise, 10 years from now, we'll find out that we really burnt out people who are already underrepresented and um, who, were, who had voices that were not always heard. So for many groups, we've been doing this work for a long time. So I would like to see the urgent mobilization of resources to really invest in this change. And I think then we will be able to measure that there was uh, a really wonderful impact 10 years from now. Well said. I think that uh, Dr. Lofter said it well, where many of us are often the only black person in the room, the only black person in the in, in, in a position. And that, that burnout, that mental strain, that, you know, so many hats, all of you wearing so many hats, it's because there are so few. And uh, we would love to see, um, you know, a, a diffusion of, of and an influx of more people to do more work and move the community more quickly. This is work that has been, we've been waiting more than a century to to do this work and the time is now and I think we have incredible momentum and clearly we have the right people around the table ready to take us forward. All right, well, thank you all for those incredible insights. I'm going to end with a little bit about uh, Women's College Hospital and what we're trying to do here to uh, make a change and to, to speak to the issues that are so important. Uh, the, you know, this, this uh, wonderful summit really started uh, because I had a great conversation with Dr. Paula Rochon, who is uh, the head of our research institute here at um, Women's College Hospital over 18 months ago. And she was talking about trying to recruit more young scientists to do research here at Women's College Hospital, specifically from the black community. And this is where Agnès' name first came up and said, you've got to talk to her at U of T. She's amazing and she's helping us do this work. And we know we need help. And so, we, we really feel that here at Women's College Hospital, there is a huge opportunity right here, right now to invest in young people who will be the next generation of researchers who will change the picture of research here in Canada and really for the world. And so about uh, nine months ago now, I established what we call the Emily Stowe Society, which is a merit-based uh, program that helps young researchers uh, us attract, advance and retain researchers throughout their whole career so that more diverse faces and more diverse uh, voices and more diverse minds are around the table. And um, I want to play you a little uh, video that we did about the Emily So Society to give you a sense of why we created it. So I'm going to cue the video and we're going to hope that technology does not fail us. <laughs> One woman refused to accept the status quo. In 1865, a young Emily Stowe applied for admission to the University of Toronto School of Medicine. She was denied simply because she was a woman. At that moment, Emily Stowe committed to doing everything in her power to ensure that one day, women would be able to study and practice medicine in Canada. She obtained her medical degree in the US and returned to Toronto as Canada's first practicing woman doctor. In 1883, a new door for women was opening with the founding of Women's Medical College, the realization of Emily's dream. It was the first place in Canada where women could study and practice medicine. 
This was the beginning of the healthcare revolution. The women that went before me found their place, but I will never forget what Dr. Edna Guest said. She was one of the brilliant women before me. And she said, now, Marion, there are a few things you must know. One of them is this. If you're asked to go in the back door, don't refuse. Someday you'll go in the front door. Well, do you think that the day will come that all women doctors can go in the front door? They can now. We've come so far, but there's still so much to do. So many barriers to break down, so many doors to open. For the last eight years of my post-secondary school training, I've actually been the only black student in my class. It's not only made it more difficult to find mentorship, but also to find solidarity and allyship in times where I believe I faced discrimination. My third year of medical school, during my clerkship, clinical rotations, I had an encounter with a patient who asked me to leave the room because they did not believe that as a black woman I could also be a part of the medical team. I thought that if I wanted to pursue a career in health sciences, it was become a doctor. I never, I never knew that research and, you know, research on communities, underserved communities actually existed. I think meeting mentors earlier in my life would have made me feel a lot more supportive and also would have opened my eyes to all these opportunities. I think I had a very narrow view of what careers could be. Being a woman and also someone who is a person of color, um, these two identities um, definitely have intersected in my life um, and have sometimes made me feel like I need to work twice as hard as anybody else to try to prove myself. Um, and it can often be quite intimidating to be in a space where you don't look like anyone else in the room um, and really having to constantly remind yourself and everyone there that you deserve to be there. We're harnessing the power of education and mentorship to ensure our scientists represent all women. We want to ensure that women across Canada will benefit from groundbreaking research conducted by diverse and empowered health researchers. Beginning with our summer student program and with the support of our donors, we'll offer financial and mentorship support to engage, retain and advance women and individuals from underrepresented communities in the health sciences. Through awareness and outreach, we'll connect with women who may be on the brink of believing the barriers they face are too great to pursue their dreams. Medicine thrives with diversity, and you can bring that unique perspective and lens that really enriches the experience for everyone. The importance of mentorship is having someone else see what you can't. And my professor saw something in me that I really couldn't because I didn't have the resources and tools to see. With a diverse body of scientists who represent women everywhere, we can discover, address, and close the health gaps that are putting women's lives and well-being at risk. I am opening the doors for all women. I am standing on the shoulders of giants. I am closing health gaps. I am representing my community. I am an ally. I am mentoring the next generation. I am the next generation of women scientists. I am black girl magic personified. I am the future. We, we are, are women. women. Uh, thank you so much. The technology worked. It's wonderful. Well, that's our, um, that's our Emily Stowe Society, which we're very proud that we launched last March uh, at our gala, which was one of the last events before the pandemic. And uh, we had a wonderful reception from the community. And we are looking forward to building um, on the summer school program right to postgraduate um, research level. And uh, we look to the uh, philanthropic community to help us do that and launch the careers of the next generation of scientists who will take the place of these wonderful people that have joined me this morning. Um, you know, 
this for me uh, pers on a personal level is such a, is such a labor of love. You know, it's so empowering to work in an institution that has the ability to uh, make an impact in an area that is so important. And I, I, I'm so, um, I'm so touched by the fact that all of you made yourself available to have this important conversation. Um, it's going to take more than this conversation to dismantle systemic anti-Black racism, but this is a powerful and meaningful first step, I believe, and we will continue this conversation. My commitment is that we will come back together again and talk about the progress that we've made um, in the years uh, to come. Um, I want to um, now turn it over to the audience to have an opportunity to speak to you um, and give an opportunity for them to ask their questions. Um, but um, I'd like to say uh, you added so much to the conversation already, and I will thank you right at the end. So let me see what the, uh, I have a couple of screens here uh, with a couple of questions. The first one is um, from Jennifer Bryan another Jennifer, uh, could Dr. Norum uh, or other panelists give an update on what's happening uh, with collecting race place data in hospitals? Kanye? Yeah, so I think actually Lydia uh, might oh, be able to answer this Lydia. as far as what is happening presently. I can tell you that when it, overall, when it comes to the collection uh, of race-based data, we are at a point in Black communities where we are trying to make sure, as she said, we are, that we are at the table and that there are data governance approaches uh, that make sure that our data is not um, collected and then misinterpreted in a way that reinforces um, stereotypes or um, biological misinterpretations of race and not, as you said, Jennifer, looking at how um, people are impacted by racism. So I'll leave it to Lydia to kind of um, speak more to that as far as what's happening in the hospitals right now. Yeah, so there's been a, a push for this to be collected consistently. Right now, it's kind of up to each limb, up to each institution of how. Um, and so we're, we're right now trying to ensure a way that the, there's data sovereignty within community of how it's collected, what it looks like, and how it's utilized. So the conversation that's happening is, what does this look like? How do we shape those questions, and how is it responsibly used? Um, so it's not consistent right now, but it's something that we're actively working on. And uh, just for clarification, I know that the city of Toronto declared, you know, Black Health a public health emergency and are very supportive of collecting data. Is that provincial or is it primarily just the city of Toronto? I know there's been a bit of back and forth on whether or not the province is also pushing for that. So I know from, from my seat, we've sat at both tables right now, it's, it's looking to be provincial. Federally, we've had conversations to say, how do we mandate that? But it's very difficult to ask for that consistently across the board, but there are um, conversations in the works of what that looks like and how do we implement it. The barrier has been that, you know, there's still a lot of healthcare professionals and researchers who don't set this as a priority. They're still saying, why do we need to have this information? Aren't all Canadians Canadian? They're not seeing the advantages of this. And so, you know, fight has been to say, well, we're seeing it. We're now seeing what the disparities are. Every time we bring this forward as collective narratives, you ask for the proof and for the data, and it's a cyclical problem that doesn't exist. So it's being pushed, and it's at the front of the agenda, and we hope even what's happened within COVID has shown um, the efficacy of having this information, but it's not yet regulated consistently. Right, and ignoring and the problem would, is not going to make it go away. Exactly. And I, I would also add that, um, you know, there are various views, but in a lot of black, in black communities, the other issue is making sure that the right type of data is collected. And there is also um, a push to making sure that experiences, right? So not just looking at the numbers, but the narrative of experiences um, inside uh, healthcare and outside impacting health are also uh, collected and analyzed appropriately. Yeah, That's analysis nice. is so important. You know, evidence-based yeah. um, research, uh, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, is actually the only way you change policy. Um, I think a lot of people think that you can just come to the table and say we're having an issue. And we know that it, because we're inside of the healthcare system, that you actually need reliable evidence-based research done at an academically affiliated organization in concert with the community that helps to shape policy in the future. And so it is so important important that this uh, issue um, gets that kind of 
of um, that kind of um, urgency uh, that the evidence-based research needs to be done now. Um, and I think, and, sorry, I think okay. it's hard when, we, when we state evidence-based, I think we also have to reframe what that means. You know, sure. a few of us have mentioned about decolonizing what yeah. research looks like. Exactly. And who are the experts and how that is applied is also important. Right. So, you know, this is why these conversations are important that we're holding institutions, you know, responsible of, well, what has been considered evidence-based or valid previously? We have to also change the parameters of that and incorporate yes. other stories and narratives into what is evidence and what is important. And I think that's such an important point because it all depends on who's asking the questions. Is the evidence important? And if the same group continues to ask the questions, the answers are obviously skewed. And I think that that whole decolonization that we've been talking about and deconstructing um, does not, uh, you know, put the results into any kind of, you know, uh, disparity. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the, the inequities that, that we're talking about, that even how we want to collect uh, information has to be scrutinized and, and has to be proven. Uh, somebody said to me, um, do we have to talk about the fact that there is racism? And I said, unfortunately, we are still having that conversation even in healthcare. So, um, I have a great question here. I'm not sure who it's from, but it says, what can non-clinicians and non-researchers do to advance Black health and diminish inequities? Anyone there want to take that on? Not everybody has the power uh, to be at the, the healthcare you know, table and at the head of that table. What could non-medical people do to uh, really help diminish uh, inequities? That's a great question from someone in the community. So, I mean, I would just say that I think when sometimes when we think of health, we're too narrow minded and we think about health within the healthcare system, but health actually applies, it applies across all policies and it applies across all sectors of our lives. So if we are doing things to improve education, if we are doing things to improve community cohesion, if we are all living our best lives and being our fabulous selves, I think that's improving health. Um, so it's not just about what clinicians and researchers do. I think whatever you can do in your own space, in your own world, a lot of what we're talking about today, these conversations are happening in every sector, right? Like you think about the Black North Initiative, they're happening in business, they're happening in media, they're happening in, um, in education, in every sector, I think, there's so much room for improvement and all of those improvements are gonna ultimately impact our health. Yeah, the intersectionality I think that we talked about off the top is so important that health is not in isolation to everyone else. You know, I'm a I'm a CEO and I have, you know, a black employees and you have to look at people as individuals and, you know, how people show up at work uh, really is about the culture of an organization. And we're talking about the culture and the values of our country. You know, we hold, you know, universal health care in such high esteem. And we fully can see through COVID, it is not universal. So all of us have a part to play in uh, decolonizing uh, healthcare. And one of the stark uh, statistics I, I, I read about was, you know, access to primary care. Many of you are family physicians, but you know, the Black community uh, does not have equitable access often to primary care, and then does not have access to specialists. So you know, as an employer, just having sometimes the empathy to give people the time they need to take care of their health whether their mental health or their physical health is so important that we look through that light, that light and that prism. Okay, I've got a couple other questions I, I want to I, get to. Sorry, can oh, I go just ahead. add one oh, please. additional piece? Of course. I just wanted to also say, I completely agree with Aisha, and, but I also think that individual patient experiences are not heard. And I often will get patients who tell me about an experience they had, but then they didn't tell anybody about it. And so every hospital has a patient relations place or, you know, an, an, an advocate for you. And if you've had any of these experiences, the way to advocate for change, it really is the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So when you have these individual experiences, they do matter, they do count and, and, and let someone know. That is a great insight. Uh, okay, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna ask one last question. I'm gonna see what we have here. Do we have another one here? Um, oh, everybody's just wishing you the best and saying that the panel's awesome. So that's really what I'm hearing. And yes, we are videoing this uh, session, and you will be able to see it again. 
Um, and here, does Women's College Hospital do anything holistic to work with holistic treatments that come from different cultures? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, does anybody uh, anybody on the panel want to speak to that? Um, whether holistic or whether what we're doing in terms of, we have a huge uh, uh, interface with the Indigenous community through our WISE practice, where we have an elder on site. You know, we let people do things like smudging before surgery. Um, we let people uh, go through their spiritual rituals before surgery, and we consult the community here here for the Indigenous population. We have a, um, a group on site that um, have quite a bit of independence, uh, a council that is accountable to the Indigenous community and works um, in leadership here at the hospital. Those, so those are some of the things we do for the Indigenous community. I do not, I, I cannot say that we do that for the Black community, but what we want to do is make this a welcoming uh, space for the Black community. We want the Black community to feel that they can, uh, they are trusted and, and they can trust us uh, in this space and we are working towards that. And this is why this uh, summit was so important to us to sort of open the doors and allow the black community to see that we are here, we hear you, we see you, and we are ready to work with you. Um, would anybody else like to weigh in on anything that is done? Um, Oni, I see here. I, not necessarily what's done, but I think what, as far as this piece around community and having the potential to be done, you know, for, for years yeah. I worked at Taibu Community Health Center which has a mandate to serve the Black community in the greater Toronto area. And I did see, you know, um, people coming um, together in ways that were, um, you know, culturally safe and, and really um, bringing their input and having, um, you know, Black and African elders bring their perspective. So even engaging that, um, that elder tradition that in some cases has been lost because of, you know, colonization, slavery, et cetera, but still exists. And so I saw, you know, I saw patients improve. Yes, I was prescribing um, medications, but I actually saw patients come off of medications because of, you know, having that collective and not feeling alone and not feeling isolated and really bringing their own perspectives into uh, the way that they would be um, treated and engaged. So I think there's huge potential and there are promising practices already out there. So in the spirit of, of engaging community and working with community, I think there's a lot that can be done because I saw it firsthand. That's wonderful. You know, uh, does anybody else want to weigh in? Elaine, go ahead. Um, Jennifer, it's um, at Women's. We know that we've done a tremendous amount of work with our Indigenous community. And as an organization, I know our president and CEO and our staff here at Women's committed to creating a culturally safe environment for all. And one way we have done that is really engaging with our communities so that they can share their lived experience with us that we can learn and continue to build programs with them for them. And an example that I can share as well, um, we had a cancer screening for our Indigenous community. They came in, they shared with us, the women shared with us their experience. We used those um, knowledge that they've shared with us and created um, a one-stop screening uh, program that we've had multiple times for mammography and POPs square screening. We started off a program with smudging as well as healing circle and building those cultural aspects into the care and the screening that we provide. And it was well received um, by our community, by our healthcare staff. And it's an opportunity for us to learn as well. And that is something that we can use from those examples and build for our Black women in our communities and other cultural community and make sure that we create those um, culturally safe environments so that we can provide care by being engaged and being informed. Wonderful. Well, I'm, you know, I could go on all day. Um, this has been a wonderful experience for me personally and on behalf of Women's College Foundation and Hospital, I thank you all for being our guests here today and taking the time to share your insights on this incredibly important subject. Um, you know, Women's College Hospital does recognize the unique and distinct experiences of Black women, and we are, um, we are committed to working with the Black community and being accountable to the Black community to um, confront and undermine and dismantle systemic anti-Black racism in healthcare and in all of its forms. And I want to end with a, a little bit of um, levity and lightness. I had the 
uh, opportunity to go to the Women Deliver Conference in Vancouver, which is the largest uh, conference on women's health in the world and women's issues in the world. And the uh, president of Ethiopia, who is this incredible woman, um, was there and she uh, ended her talk with a, um, an African proverb. And I don't think you could end with a better uh, proverb. Um, and it says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. And uh, that is so true. And this is a huge problem. And we do not try to make light of how big of a problem it is. But we must believe we are the mosquito and we can make a difference. And we can change the tra trajectory of healthcare for Black people, in particular, Black women. So I thank you all on behalf of Women's College Hospital. I thank again our sponsors, CIBC and Gynacare, for joining us today. And I wish you health, wellness, and happiness. Thank you all for being with us.